Welcome to Frank's Diana Explains. Today's topic is an addendum to the algorithms course, and I have a special treat for you. If you've been following my course, then by now you should have got through to Quicksort. Well, a few years ago when I got to the Quicksort lecture, I was lucky enough that an exceptionally qualified guest accepted my invitation to address the class. And now, back from my archives, here it is for you too. Hear about Quicksort and much more from the horse's mouth, with his characteristic modesty and humor. Be sure to leave a like on this special video and to subscribe to this channel for plenty more cool computer science stuff. And at this point, I would like uh, to shut up because uh, we are blessed today with a guest star, guest star uh, who received an ACM uh, Alan Turing Award and a Kyoto Prize and a IEEE John von Neumann Medal. And if you look at uh, his Wikipedia page, there's a half a dozen honorary doctorates uh, and he has invented many things communicating sequential processes, uh, horror logic, so I'm giving a slight hint, uh, uh, but uh, he is here and he's uh, maybe to his regret probably best known for having invented quicksort which has obfuscated the glory of all the other wonderful things he has done for which he has earned uh, knighthood from Queen Elizabeth II for services to computer science and education. So please welcome on stage uh, Professor Sir Tony Hoare. So there, yes, uh, you, you can see uh, his nature of a Jedi master. Uh, over here, he will enlighten you and respond to all your questions. So, do you like to stand or like to sit? This is a microphone for you. Yes. Okay. I'll get this out of your way. So, uh, I guess uh, we will take questions from the audience, and I'll prime the audience. So, please do ask questions. You are now sitting in a class, and when you are when you're old. You can tell your grandchildren, look, I studied uh, computer science at Cambridge, and in my first year, I could ask questions of the man who invented quicksort. <laughs> uh, so the, the first question I would like to ask you is, how old were you when you invented quicksort? It was 1960, so I suppose I was 22. 22? How many of you are 22 here? How, how old are you guys? 20, maybe. 19. So you still have a few years to invent something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and when one is 22, how does one invent an algorithm that gets written up in all the textbooks in the world? Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> Quite by chance. Uh, for interesting reasons, which I won't go into, I became interested in sorting um, while I was a student at um, Moscow State University in 1960. Um, the, um, uh, and so I uh, had attended a programming course at Oxford University in 1959 um, in which I learned a, a very simple autocode programming language. I thought I would try and see how I would write this, al um, this algorithm in that autocode. Sorry, how did I get it? The first idea that I had of how to sort was, I think, bubble sort, certainly one of the slower sorts. And I was able to calculate quite quickly that it was n squared in its uh, performance and uh, felt dissatisfied and thought I would try and invent something quicker. And it didn't take me any longer to invent quick sort than it took me to invent bubble sort. So I can't really reconstruct my thought processes. I wasn't thinking. It just came to me. <laughs> Very lucky. Um, if you happen to wish at some later stage in life to 
have an academic career, um, uh, because my first job was actually with industry, um, but I later moved to university. If you want to move like that, it is a bit of a disadvantage not to have a, a second degree. I have no uh, doctorate other than honorary doctorates uh, to my name, and I didn't have any of those when I first moved into um, academic life. Um, so if you don't have a doctorate, then to have invented quicksort is just about the best thing you could have done. <laughs> However, you've got to face, face it that it will make you more famous than the whole of the rest of your life's work, which has, has, um, takes me back to 1960 again, um, when I uh, moved into uh, computing. So I have another question about the fact that you spent so much of your distinguished career looking at ways to uh, get insights into the correctness of programs. When you invented Quicksort, how did you convince yourself that he was actually always doing the right thing? Um, the, um, oh, it wasn't so difficult. I mean, the, the difficult thing is to keep the indices straight. Um, and I didn't know anything about recursion in those days. Um, so uh, the writing of the partition was quite easy, but then how do you save up all the um, unsorted parts that you still have to sort? So um, I started in Mercury Autocode um, to write a, the administration of uh, keeping a, a list. Uh, I didn't know anything about lists in those days. Um, but if effectively keeping a list or a pile of uncompleted tasks. And it wasn't until I was reading a description of a much more powerful programming language called Algol 60, uh, which had recursion in it, uh, that I realized that recursion would solve the problem very easily. So I wrote that up and published, in, published it in the communications of the ACM in this language, Algol, um, and uh, well, that was the first publication. And then um, later I wrote up a fuller description uh, together with um, a, a formal estimate of how long it would take, um, accurate estimate of how long it would take um, in the computer journal uh, a, few, a, few, a year later. So I knew, I knew right away from before I gave it the name Quicksort I knew it was logarithmic um, by a simple argument, um, but very crude argument that considered only f to, to begin with only the case in which the um, uh, pivot happened to be halfway through the um, uh, through the array array through the sorted array. The best case uh, was certainly logarithmic. Um, and one could work that out um, uh, quite quite easily. However, of course, the best case isn't always, and um, so in my computer journal article, I worked out supposing all the orderings were of equal probability as they could be if you chose the pivot at random, um, and. Um, uh, then uh, what, what would the uh, performance be? And it's, it's by solving some rather hairy um, differential difference equations, uh, one can calculate that it's still log logarithmic. So I worked out a formula of how long it would take in terms you know, with parameters uh, indicating um, how long the various loops in the process uh, were in your uh, machine code version of this sorting algorithm. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Speak up. Please speak up. Uh, what was your initial idea of choosing the pivot? What is the initial idea of choosing the pivot was... Um, I fairly soon got the idea of choosing it at random. Um, and... Uh, using what were called Monte Carlo methods. Um, I, I once called Quicksort uh, probably the only algorithm which uses methods from a numerical analysis 
Monte Carlo methods and recursion in business applications. Sorting was big business in those days. Still is. And they still use quicksort in Microsoft, I was told, quite recently. Um, down, down to a certain uh, a level. Um, to sort things that weren't, aren't anywhere near sorted at the moment. So probably when you re resort, resort your inbox, they probably use quicksort. Um, but they, they stop it uh, fairly soon um, when they calculate from the size of the caches in the memory of their computers um, that it would be faster to get the whole segment inside one of the caches and then they use a different method. Heap sort, for example. Are you going to do heap sort? We done half of heap sort last time and we're going to finish next time. Oh, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> You want to say something about quick heap sort? Yes, sure. Oh, yeah, we have a question yes, over there. I have a question okay. first. Um, I get the impression that a lot of the best algorithms are turned out by theoretical computer scientists nowadays that are generally like, condemned as impractical to actually implement in software uh, because, because they can have certain overheads and that sort of thing. My, my question to ask you is your opinions on this and do you think in terms of five degrees these new algorithms? Oh, I, I hope so. Um, I'm, I'm very bad at predicting things, though. So. Um, I think that research is the job of researcher to come up with a lot of things that are never used. And therefore, we shouldn't regret that it takes ten times as much research to produce one really good and applicable idea. Um, a um, friend of mine once pointed out that 95% um, of all the problems in the world are insoluble by research. A lot of them have happened recently, I think. Um, and 95% of research uh, will never be applied even to the remainder. And therefore, your actual tra transfer hopes when you're, if you're a researcher into practice uh, become rather almost vanishingly small. But on that va vanishingly small of successful research, uh, valid research, uh, that turns out to be maybe many years later uh, useful for something quite unpredictable, um, on, th on that fraction of 1%, all of modern technology, all of modern engineering, and all of modern knowledge of science actually depends. So, well, thank you. How heavily were you involved in um, the further research and development of Quicksort after you first invented it? I, I gave it up after I got two publications and I've never returned to it except to teach it. Um, I'll give you a little exercise, if you like. How do you make Quicksort a little, a little bit faster by making the inner loops a little bit faster? The inner loops of the partition algorithm um, are... Um, uh, you make two tests. Are you outside the bounds of the um, segment that you're sorting? And is the pivot uh, greater or less than the, one, the card that you're looking at? So uh, the challenge is to remove one of those tests. Make sure that you never, um, uh, you never overflow the, the bounds without explicitly testing for it. And when you write that bit of the algorithm up as a program, I think you might like to use a little bit of whole logic to prove that you've got it right, because it depends on facts. Uh, that is not are not made, not very obviously explicit in the code. Do we have any more questions? Well, while the students are yeah, there's another one. Can you speak up, please? Sorry. 
presenting null and working with that mental state? Yes. What should it have done like, to turn back to the test? How would it have designed their whole reference game to run with the null? So this gentleman says, it is said that you regretted inventing null, and if you could go back, what would you have rather done? Well, I have my excuses for inventing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, and I, I did consider alternatives, but they were very, very cumbersome. Uh, the main alternative... Uh, was to uh, adopt a um, language feature of um, te um, testing uh, what uh, uh, testing whether the thing is null or uh, uh, testing what subclass um, a pointer points to before every access uh, to the object uh, concerned, and that's very neat, but. But very cumbersome because you very often know that you know that it's not null when you um, uh, b b before you do the access, and this is where um, whole logic comes in. How do you know and maintain that knowledge? Um, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft is uh, um, investigating a possible. Um, uh, feature that would enable the programmer to declare uh, whether uh, a different object classes. Do you know about object classes? Yes. Yes. What do they yes. Know? Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they have know. done some object, different object classes. classes yes. That if you have an object class with a component, um, a pointer component, you can declare that you are never going to assign null to it. It makes, it makes initialization a bit difficult. I mean, you have to initialize it at the same time uh, to something other than null, which can, if you're setting up a loop, it's a little bit tricky, but, but maybe it can be done. Um, the, um, the other technique is to say that you are going to test um, every time that you do um, a reference to it. In that case, you can assign null, um, but it's safe to do so because you know that everybody's going to um, test it. And the complexities of organizing those two, two different kinds of class um, is sufficient to give them some pause uh, whether this is worth actually delivering or not. So may, maybe I was speculating about this, but I didn't have the concept of a class um, uh, originally to, to um, I didn't have a concept of a class. It, it all became too, too complicated, and so I allowed null. A friend of mine, um, one of the first uh, people that I told about the object-oriented, um, uh, the, the ideas of using types uh, to check the validity of every point of reference, uh, which is indeed um, uh, was first incorporated in a language that I, uh, I designed uh, uh, in collaboration with, with a friend of mine, Niklaus Wirt. Um, I told him about that and he said he didn't like the null pointer because if you use it, a, a, an object to represent a person's uh, spouse uh, in, a, um, in an object, um, then uh, it would appear that the null person was highly bigamous. There were many people married to them, to it. Which, <laughs> yes, rather a biting comment. Yes. <laughs> the question is, what do you think is what? What would you say is your favorite uh, sorting algorithm? Oh, well, I, I, I think the one that I. Yeah. I think the question is isomorphic to is the Pope Catholic. I think so. Yes, yes. Um, when I first got a job, um, I, I, I worked in the British computer industry for the first eight years of my career. Um, my boss gave me a chance, gave me a, 
uh, task, um, my first serious task, of implementing a sorting algorithm for the company's computers. And uh, we all wrote them in machine code in those days. Um, the sorting algorithm is called shell sort because it was invented by um, somebody called Shell, and it was a version of an insertion sort, which was um, uh, people claim was well, it was extremely difficult to analyze, but it was certainly faster than insertion sort. The reason why it was faster was that it sort it didn't didn't go from the left end to the right end. It took a subarray um, and sorted. Uh, things that, that are f far apart from each other. You first sort those two, and then those two, and then those two, and then those two, and then those two, and those, then those two. So all your big jumps are done in a single operation on the right. Then you halve the interval, and you sort those ones and then that just that pair. And the smaller, a lot of the smaller jumps. Um, take place. So right at the very end you run a straight insertion sort because that's good enough um, because they're all nearly in order and we reach the uh, final stage of the quick sort um, uh, where everything is already um, in small enough chunks that insertion sort is not too um, slow. So it was quite a little complicated algorithm and my boss was quite quite impressed that I was able to do it. Um, and I said, um, I think I know a faster way of doing this. <laughs> because this was after I'd invented Quicksort. And he said, I bet you don't. So I explained it to him and he lost his bet. <laughs> he never paid me. <laughs> How much was the bet? Sixpence. Six Come and take me. Yeah. Ah. Could, could be rich, rich now. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I've got, got, if I've got, if I've got tap and take me for everybody who's ever used Quicksort, I'd be rich. <laughs> okay, do we have a last question? Uh, what was it like being an experienced student during the Cold War? Uh, very interesting indeed. Um, really most exciting year. What can I say? Um, well, our rooms were bugged, so everything we said in the room was uh, okay. I made some good friends in the university, whom I never wrote to, because I couldn't. One thing I could never do, never allowed, to, never allowed myself to do, was to talk about one friend, uh, in, uh, talk about a friend in my room, because they weren't necessarily out to get me when they bugged the room, they were out to get have I got any contact? What are my contacts? And I assume that even my best friends uh, knew, were known, and knew that they were known, and had permission to talk to me. I mean, essentially. Um, so, uh, first time I, I sort of mentioning their name when I was back in my family. I stopped myself actually mentioning it, even in my own home, because I'd been so used to not mentioning anybody. Well, that was sort of what it was like. But it was great fun. That's, Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Okay.